Awesome. Well, <laughs> welcome, Graham. Thank you for giving us your time today. Thanks really appreciate me. it. So Graham is the owner of Toolshed Brewing. You're also an avid public speaker, much sought after from what I've been told. And uh, you've accomplished a lot in the last while. You also do a, a fair bit of downhill biking as well, correct? Yeah, mountain biking, like cross country is my, is my jam, yeah. Awesome, and you have a wife and kids as well. Absolutely. Awesome, so uh, tell us just briefly a little bit about the brewery. Okay, you mean like the, the origins of it, like how we started? Uh, or? What it is and what you guys do. Okay, yeah, so Toolshed Brewing Company is, is the brewery. We're, uh, we're a local craft brewery here in town. And uh, um, yeah, brewing is, uh, is an interesting thing. It, it's one of those industries that connects the community around a thing. You know, like I, I, I think maybe the best way to describe it is I've always wanted to bring good people together to share good times and good stories. And uh, that's kind of the secret of life for me, is bringing good people together to share good times and good stories. Beer does that better than anything else. Awesome. Yeah. So before we dive into the deep of it, yeah. a quick message from our sponsors. Our first sponsor is Symbol Syndication, which is a video production company that I started. We do video production and online marketing for businesses of all sizes, ranging from solopreneurs to Fortune 500 companies. Our second sponsor is Gravity Cafe. They've been gracious enough to give us their space. The coffee's awesome. They have live music three nights a week. The beer's great. It's an awesome place to come hang out. Our third sponsor is the Better Business Bureau. For over 100 years, BBB has helped consumers and businesses make smarter decisions. With a mission of advancing marketplace trust, BBB is a resource to consumers and businesses by providing a framework for ethical enterprise and for handling marketplace disputes in an unbiased process. BBB accredited businesses fund our extensive community engagement and consumer education programs, allowing BBB to be a valued source of information and advice for consumers and businesses alike. BBB, start with trust. Our fourth sponsor is Limitless Furniture. They provided these awesome chairs in this table. You can find them in Inglewood, awesome place to get high-end furniture. I would highly recommend checking them out. All right. So tell us a little bit about how Toolshed Brewing came about. How did you sure. and Jeff meet? Yeah, so, um, so Jeff and I came together probably like no other brewery ever has before. We met in Kabul, Afghanistan, of all places. And uh, uh, so back in the day, this was 2007, Jeff and I were IT nerds. And, and uh, we worked over in Afghanistan in support of the US military, the Canadian military, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, um, we would design and implement uh, top secret tactical communication networks for the US Marine Corps, the Canadian troops, SATCOM really. It's kind of a different world, you know, when you're, when you're over in, in, uh, in a war zone designing, uh, you know, encrypted tactical communication networks. But I met Jeff over there. And, and the funny thing about it is, is, is Jeff lives three blocks away from me here in Calgary. And we meet as roommates over in Kabul, Afghanistan, implementing these types of networks. So, so kind of a funny story, but, um, but what was neat was, so here we are, we're roommates over in Kabul. And what I think bonded us together and why we became friends was we loved this kind of maybe a back and forth battle of taking hobbies too far. So we would kind of, you know, compete against each other on who could take the hobby too far. So we got into coffee, we got into roasting our own beans and getting insane coffee machines for our homes. And we got into barbecue and, and, and we compete in the Canadian Nationals in competitive barbecue. So smoking ribs and, and brisket and pulled pork and everything, but not just smoking ribs. I, I've got my pit in my backyard. It's, it's networked, it's got its own IP address it, and it'll tweet you and let you know uh, when the ribs are ready. There's an infrared camera that looks at the meat and I can give you administrative access to log in and have a look at the meat. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty badass. <laughs> the pit is, is, and it's a charcoal pit, right? So it's, uh, it's adding tech to the, the hobbies that you love. So, so yeah, I think, I think the main thread that, that Jeff and I loved was uh, we loved taking hobbies too far, but we also loved hobbies that brought people together. And that's coffee and that's barbecue and that's beer. I loved, uh, if I could get people to come over to my place and enjoy the best coffee they've ever had or the best rack of ribs they've ever had, right? And eventually that's what led into the beer was, uh, beer I think is just the next logical step when you're trying to bring good people and you know together and, and, and to share good stories and good times. Uh, so we started brewing beer in my backyard tool shed. And 
from the first moment that we brewed, we brewed our very first beer and it was magnificent, this first beer. I remember thinking it should be crap because we don't know what we're doing. Uh -huh. And we made all these mistakes. And we, when we went to get the ingredients for the recipe, we had like all the wrong stuff and we were just substituting things. But the beer was so damn good. And the people that came over to our house to try it loved it so much. We knew we were onto something. And along that road comes the inevitable question, what if? What if we didn't have to do our jobs anymore and we could do this for a living, right? And that therein lies the, uh, I guess, the start, the spark of the entrepreneurial journey. You got something that you think might be better than the crap you're dealing with <laughs> in your nine to five job. Yeah. I don't know what you deal with in your nine to five, but in mine, we were getting shot at. There's kidnapping attempts. There's bombs going off in Afghanistan, right? And we think, what if we could brew beer for a living? <laughs> that would be better than Afghanistan. We'll and that her. was, yeah. And, you know, I have a wife and three kids at home that do not like that I, I live in Afghanistan for as long as I do every year, right? Six months to a year at a time. And so, uh, so that's, that's the start of it is what if? What if we could start a brewery and not have to go back to Afghanistan? That was the start. So what was the next step after that? Did you develop a business plan or did you look sure. at what it would take to move from a shed to a... Yeah. a inspected certified location, I guess? Sure, yeah, we looked at it, and, and one of the things that we looked at was that there was no breweries in the province. And you know, when you think about a business that you want to get into, and you go, wow, nobody's doing it. You think, what a great time, what a great opportunity. Yeah. And you quit your job, and you go after it. Um, but inevitably, I think a lot of times, if, if there's nobody doing something in a, in a city or in a region, a lot of times there's a good reason for that. In our case, mm -hmm. the reason was it was illegal to do what we were trying to do in Alberta. We went after writing a business plan to, to start a brewery. Uh, the mm -hmm. problem with Alberta at that time was that uh, the laws were you had to show the government that you could brew 500,000 liters of beer a year or more, even to apply to be a brewery in Alberta. So, wow. so here, here we are. We've, you know, I've gone into my house and told my wife I quit my job to go after the dream, right? And, and yeah. don't worry, babe, we're going to do it. <laughs> All right, and my wife hates beer. Oh, no. She wants nothing to do with beer. I think this is part of what most entrepreneurs go through. I mean, maybe not that their wife is totally against what they start out with, but um, it's a tough thing to go into the house and say to your wife, okay, honey, we don't make money anymore, we make beer, right? And, uh, and I'm still just a home brewer in the tool shed. And, and you know, Jeff and I are clever dudes. We wrote a great business plan, but when you find out that what you're trying to do is is illegal uh, in the province and that people that have gone before you that have tried to start breweries mm -hmm. have either left the province or left the country, you mm -hmm. know, in, in an effort to get a, a brewery started. Um, it's pretty disheartening. So people as big as Lanny McDonald tried to start breweries and, uh, and these, these insane laws of how big your brewery had to be in this province to us seemed unfounded. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't figure out why these laws were in place, but we also couldn't figure out why nobody had stuck around and fought the fight to get them changed. Right. And um, maybe the straw that broke the camel's back was when we found out that Lanny McDonald, our local hockey hero, had a brewery, and it wasn't in Alberta. It wasn't even in Canada. It's down in Montana. Mm. So even people with millions of dollars and influence and, and uh, the ability to lobby and make a noise, if they can't get a brewery started in Alberta, who the hell are we? Mm -hmm. Right? I'm some, I mean, I'm a ginger, but I'm not Lanny McDonald. I have yeah. no mustache. My mustache is, is atrocious. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I laugh uh, and, and kind of refer to it as we kind of got married that night, Jeff and I. Yeah. Because you, you literally look at across the tool shed at your business partner to be, and you go, okay, are you, are you willing to spend 18 hours a day with me for the rest of our lives? Because that's what it might take. We're going to be in this thing forever. And we're going to see each other more than we see our spouses, our actual spouses. But we had a couple of concepts that we said we got to, we have to abide by. One of them was that we would we would uh, plan for nothing but total success, uh -huh. meaning every decision we're going to make, we're going to balance that back or measure that back on total success. Yeah. We're planning for total success. So are the decisions we make based on we're going to crush it? And the other one was we're just not going to stop until we've achieved that. So, so in planning for total success, yep. did you still have a partial plan or contingencies no. in case things no. worked, went wrong along Absolutely the way? Absolutely not. I think that for us, one of the things that worked and was so important was there's no dipping your toe in the water. 
Yeah. You don't get to say, oh, that's cold water. I better go back to Afghanistan. We quit our jobs. We went after this thing all or nothing. Mm -hmm. And there's a concept of having your back against the wall that you have to succeed or your family perishes. So what did you risk at this point? Absolutely everything in our lives, our families, our marriages, our homes. I mean, I've got, uh, I was the only breadwinner in my family at the time. And mm -hmm. so I have a wife and three kids and a mortgage and my kids go to a school and that, that you know, is expensive. And, and uh, I mean, this is, this is nothing new. This isn't I'm some, you know, unique story that I risked everything. This is, I think, one of the real core concepts behind why Toolshed succeeded is because when to. you're a rabid dog with your back against the wall, it's a fist fight every day to get it done, but you get it done because you have to. There's no other option. Yeah. And the first concept or the first struggle that you come up against is the legalities of what you're trying to do provincially. Well, that's not an insurmountable barrier. It just means nobody's done it before. Mm -hmm. So we, we set out to change the laws. And we knew we couldn't change the laws by fighting the government or making you know them, like belittling them or suing them. The people were in litigation with the provincial government over, over these, uh, these rules, but that doesn't, it never works to sue the government, I think is what I've, yeah. I've learned, right? So what we did was we said, what if we could make a noise so big about local craft beer that the community around us would hoist us up on their shoulders and stand for what we stood for. The mm -hmm. government would eventually look and say, we got, I mean, this is, this is who votes for us. We got to do something here. So what we did was we made a noise about Alberta, about agriculture, about the local farmers. We actually have the greatest barley on the earth right here in Alberta. The best breweries on earth use Alberta barley. So what we did was we said, uh, if we can't brew here, can we import our beer? And the government said, yep, you can import, you just can't brew here. So ridiculous, but whatever, fine. So we found a brewery out in BC that let us brew our beer in their facility. And then we shipped our, our barley across the province, uh, uh, over the border to British Columbia, drove 12 hours out to this brewery just outside of Vancouver, brewed our beer with Alberta barley right out there, drove back home, and then imported our own beer back into the province. And that wow. allowed us to make a noise. Yeah. And we went to the media, we went to every radio station that would listen, every TV station that would listen, every newspaper that would listen. And there was a lot of people that were in the media at that time that, that said, holy crow, these guys aren't just saying, do you realize what we would have to do? They're saying, look at what they're doing. That, that truck right there has almost 600,000 kilometers on it because of driving out to BC and back a couple times a week to, to brew our beer. But that's what... I think made uh, a big impact on our, our provincial government to say, this is a pretty antiquated law. It's time to it's time for change. So we know that we didn't do it individually. There was a lot of people trying to get this law changed, but uh, sometimes it takes you know a noise at that amplitude, right? You, you need some decibels with your noise to make the government change their mind sometimes. And so December 2013, the uh, the AGLC changed the requirements to start a brewery. They went from that. 500,000 liter minimum to zero minimum. Wow. And, and so that was a, a massive win for us. We, for the rest of our lives, will take that to our graves, that we were a part of that change mm -hmm. that opened up the floodgates to all the almost 100 breweries in the province that you see now uh, that are flourishing. And, and uh, I mean, like literally, there's two breweries in our city at that time. Now there's three on my city block wow. right, where, where Toolshed is. So yeah. that's, a, that's a huge win. How did you go about getting financing? How did you approach that? Because oh. there's a lot of options for that in business, but this would have probably been a difficult one because yeah. I imagine the banks here didn't have a lot of history with funding breweries. Mm -hmm. No, they had none. There was no breweries that were funded. In fact, the one brewery that popped up just before us was Village Brewery, and oh. that was uh, um, a, a bunch of uh, fellows that had worked at, at Big Rock for uh, and, I, and, and Molson before. I think they touted something like 157 years of combined brewing experience, and they didn't need to go to the bank. So we were really one of the very first breweries going to try to get funding from a bank. And we were laughed at. I went to my bank that I that I have been with since I was a little kid. And, and when debit cards first came out, you know, now you're a little guy and you go to get your debit card. That's how long I was with my bank. And they literally laughed in our faces uh, trying to trying to get money for this venture. And, and that's a frustrating thing for anybody starting a business because where else do you go? 
Yeah. You go to the bank you've been with since you, since you were a kid. That's the longest relationship I have with any business in my life is my bank. And they they actually laughed. And, and their comment to us when we showed them our business plan, they said, a brewery? Well, that's adorable. That's, that's the, wow. yeah, that was the comment we got. So we're no longer with that bank anymore. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that's a tough thing. So you go, okay, well, screw banks. Uh, I'll go talk to some investors because... I watched Dragon's Den, yeah. right? Investors believe in the, the people, not just the business plan, yeah. right? So uh, so you go and you meet a bunch of people around the city, you show them what you're going to do. But if you're a savvy investor, you're going to ask qualifying questions like, yeah. have you done this before successfully, right? So no, I have not done this before. I've lived in Afghanistan for the last however many years. So you don't have the qualifying features of what a bank or an investor wants to feel safe with their money. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't, again, this is not anything unique to me. I'm a random IT ginger, right, who just spent time overseas doing, doing IT work, who now wants to start a brewery. And I've got a great business plan. I know it's going to succeed. I'm planning for nothing but total success. But I can't convince a bank or an investor uh, to give me a penny. Really, we learned a lot on this in this journey. And what blew our minds was the whole way along when we were trying to get money from banks and investors, we had friends that said, man, I'm in. And I, I don't know about you, but I was raised never to take money from friends. My dad yeah. was always telling me that that's the fastest way to lose a friend. Yeah. So you don't mix friends and money. And, and so great. So my friends would say, I want to invest in tool shit. I go, nah, no, nah, it's all good. Don't worry, we'll be fine. And, uh, and I remember it was one of my absolute best friends. He lives in the city here. Uh, he's a firefighter. His name is Chuck. And, and Chuck, the firefighter, goes, dude, I don't have a lot of money, but, uh, uh, but I have $50,000 to my name. And, and he goes, I just believe in you. And I know you're going to do it. Uh, but I can't give you all my money because I'm getting married this month. So I can only give you 40 grand. <laughs> right? And I'm like, there's no way I can take this guy's money. How on earth? I'm, and I'm, just, I'm like standing up as his best man in his wedding. I can't go to this dude's wedding, stand up and, and, and see them get married, then come home and take his life savings, right? right. But I did. <laughs> That's ultimately all the only, the only area sometimes when you're getting started that you'll find money. Yeah. And I came home and I told my wife that this guy was trying to give us money. And, uh, and, and I told her, don't worry. I said no to Chuck. And my wife goes, well, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean I'm an idiot? No, I said no to Chuck. Don't worry. I'm thinking this is a good thing. I'm not going to mix friends and, and money. Yeah. And she says, well, what happened to your planning for nothing but total success? And I'm like, wow. Like, she just calls me right out. And, of course, we're planning for total success. But in my own head, I'm still apprehensive. And what if we fail and Chuck's not my friend anymore because I lose his money? Yeah. Well, then I'm not planning for total success, yeah. right? I'm, I'm, I don't even believe my own hype, right? And so there's a real moment of, of laying awake at night and, and stressing out on, do I even believe that we're going to be totally successful? Because mm -hmm. if I do, Chuck the firefighter should be the guy who's along for the ride, yeah. not somebody else who's, you know, who's, who I'm, I'm not emotionally attached to. And so when I told you that, that I was all in, when you said, you know, what have you invested in this? And what, you know, I'm not even just all in with my all in. Mm -hmm. I'm all in with all the people I love around me with their all in. And that's, I think, the true, the true definition of all in. No room for failure at all. No there. room for failure. You, you're all in with the people, all the people you love around you with mm -hmm. their all in. <laughs> right? So if I screw up, Chuck the firefighter's getting divorced. Mm -hmm. Okay. We needed millions of dollars, but but that was that that was a mental hurdle of accepting money from people that uh, I didn't think I I should be taking money from. So what Toolshed is still to this day is ten good friends that believed in in Jeff and I. So a lot of times now when I uh, I speak a lot to uh, to universities and kids that are are going to school mm -hmm. and they're going to take over the world, they're going to be entrepreneurs, and they're going to get something crazy started. And I always love, love asking, you know, like the old brewmaster college, like, who wants to start a brewery? Every single kid in that, in that program wants to start their own brewery. Yeah. And I go, great. So who here has a friend that they believe in so much that they would give their life savings to that friend? <laughs> right? And all the hands go down. Yeah. And I go, okay, well, that's a problem if you're not that friend mm -hmm. to all the people that have known you for 20 years. 
because a lot of times you're just not going to get the money from the bank. You're not going to get it from investors. You're going to have to have those people that say, Jonathan, are you the guy that, that I would believe in so much that I would give my life savings to? Because whatever you're going to start, I believe in so much. Here you go. Yeah. That's a, that's a reality oh. check, bro. And I think that that's, a, that's an awesome level of burden because uh, uh, there's, there absolutely is no failure. There's no way to say, oh, sorry, guys, we didn't pull it off this time, but next time you just know that you have the lives of the people around you that are so important to you in your hands. Uh, and, and there's no option but, but total success, right? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people, I believe, they want to get out of the nine to five job yeah. because they believe they're going to have the flexibility of being their own boss. They're right. going to get to do what they love. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't really realize that they're going to be spending more of their time on managing a business sure. than doing what they love. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much work they're going to have to do when they first start a business. Yeah. So can you touch on a little bit on how much time you had to put in in the beginning, how much time you and Jeff had to put in, how yep. much effort you had to put in? It was 18 hours a day. Yeah, almost every day. And so that's different than a 9 to 5 because a 9 to 5 is for somebody else. Yeah. 18 hours a day for your baby is is different than 9 to 5 for somebody else, right? When your baby's sitting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and so uh, Jeff and I were, were fortunate to be um, named as uh, top 40 under 40. And one of the questions they asked us, if you look at the magazine, it says, lay out your day with, with how much sleep you get, how much time you have for family, how much time you have for exercise. And we laughed as we did this. We submitted our, our numbers, and they texted us back and said, no, this is a mistake. It just This just says you work 18 hours a day and sleep for you know an hour and a half at night. I'm like, yeah, that's it. I don't work out. I don't have time for my family. I don't have time for friends. You know, it's at the beginning of, of starting a business. It's just whatever that business needs, it has to get. You don't get to say, well, you know, I, I maybe I should just take some time for myself right now. That's a luxury you do not get yeah. at the beginning when you've got the burden of, of everybody that you love around you right on your shoulders, depending on you to get it done. You just do whatever it takes. And if it was 26 hours a day, I would have done 26 hours a day. Well, we have, we're, we're approaching 50 employees right now at the brewery, um, but back then it was two. It was Jeff and myself, right? My, my, my buddy Jeff and I had all the roles, and, and we sat down and said, okay, what are all the roles that it takes to run this business? And there was something like 300 jobs, right? And, and so we said, okay, let's write our names beside all these jobs because we have to know who's responsible for every job in the brewery. Yep. Okay, so sales, Graham. Tap room, Graham, spreadsheets, Jeff, accounting, Jeff, brewing, Jeff and Graham, right? And, and we just wrote our names beside everything. And yeah. so you just go off and you do all of the jobs. I would get home around two or three in the morning because mm -hmm. you're literally, you're driving out to brew, you're driving back home, you're trying to build the brewery. You get off, you finish brewing, you're, you're driving downtown trying to sell your beer, trying to get people excited about what you're doing, trying to you know, give samples away, and, and you're at all the bars and the pubs trying to make a noise for, for your brewery. And my wife gets up and leaves for, gets up at 5 o'clock to leave for work. So I get home at 2 or 3 in the morning. Yeah. I wouldn't dare go up to bed and wake her up a few hours before she gets up, right? So I just chill out on the couch, watch some ridiculous, stupid TV for a minute, and, and then when she wakes up, make her coffee, take her to the train station. That's our wow. time together. Our time together was, was from 5 to 5.30 in the morning. And oh. then and off she'd go to work. And then I'd, I would take the kids to school and come home at 2 or 3 in the morning. So for it was a long time that I only saw my wife from 5 to 5.30 a.m. How old were your kids when you started the brewery? It was, it, we started the brewery in 2013. Uh, and now it's 2018. So my kids right now are 12, 13, and 14, 7, 8, 9. I guess you, you kind of really were able to spend some time around them for the formative ages, even though you're in Afghanistan and stuff. But no, do you yeah. feel like you missed a chunk of them growing up? Absolutely, yeah. It's and, and, you know, in your mind, you say, well, I'm doing this for my kids. But it's a tough thing, boy, when you're missing volleyball games or you're missing the city championships, you're missing, you know, uh, uh, big parts of their development. And uh, you're trying to balance it in your head that I'm doing this for them, but... Am I, or am I convincing myself of that? And yeah, it's uh, 
it's a hard, hard journey. Those, those years, those, those, you know, they say it's at least five years to get a business up to a point where you can take some time and, and, and get away from it and be okay. And uh, yeah, the first, the first five years of, of Toolshed were, uh, were a very hard thing. And I, I, uh, uh, I'm very fortunate that my wife and my three sons were all uh, dedicated to, uh, to the cause and they, yeah. were, they were willing to sacrifice and willing to uh, contribute. You know, that we, we had a lot of years of, uh, boy, my boys would come and label cans, right? And, and they'd, they'd be in the back with me and, and uh, canning beer and labeling beer uh, throughout the night. It's one of those things that you have to get your head wrapped around that where it's, you're not a victim of it, your family are all sacrificing for, for something neat. So we would, we, would have, uh, we would have great conversations about why we're, we're, we're sacrificing right now and what we're doing and why we're building the business and, and uh, to teach the boys about hard work and, and about work ethic and about making that sacrifice. Uh, yeah, those, those early years of hard work, what I, what I look back on now and I, I'm so thankful for, my boys were old enough to understand that the success that Toolshed is experiencing now is, more, is nothing to do with anything other than the hard work that they were a part of in the beginning years. So, so it's not, there's no luck, there's no, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard freaking work and sacrifice. So they were old enough to see that that's what it took. I don't think anyone would argue that you would be considered a successful or quite successful business owner, yeah. but do you have any regrets around that whole side of the sacrifice for the family and stuff like that? No, I have absolutely no regrets because, you know, everything from, from the moment we start to now is perspective, mm -hmm. right? And so I could look back and say, boy, I wish I was at home more. Well, mm -hmm. I, could, I could be at home more working a shitty job and being in Afghanistan more, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it, it truly is all perspective. And I remember my son coming home from school one day and saying, Dad, I know Toolshed is going to be a success. And I'm like, really? Why? And, uh, and he said, because we as a family work harder than any other family in our school. And I was like, oh, he gets it. My son, who I'm trying to raise to know all the things in life that, that you want as a father for your son to learn, uh, understood the concept of the, if we do pull it off at Toolshed, it's because we're working harder than anybody else he knows. He, he made that connection that we work harder than anybody else. What a win as a father, right? Oh, yeah. And so, um, so no, they, I mean, my kids don't look back and go, Dad, you weren't around. You know, they, I know that we're going to share fun stories of them working illegally in a brewery. When they should not be working <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a brewery. They could operate my whole canning line, right? But yeah. uh, that is not allowed for a young kid to be <laughs> in a brewery working in a canning line. Yeah. But those are fun stories now that we get to look back on and say, you know, my, my, my young boys can pour a perfect beer. Yeah. Right. They know they're bittering units. They can t taste an IPA and pull out, you know, aromatic notes. Right. Because because uh, they're my sons. They've brewed with me in the tool shed. They're they're part of this family business. So uh, so I don't think I don't think you. I, I think if you're looking back with regrets, it's uh, it's a mistake because uh, I know that the things that we screwed up. Mm -hmm. uh, still are not regrets because we learn so much from them. We're better for them. So mm -hmm. there are so many great lessons to be learned along uh, the, the, you know, the, the journey of starting a business. Jeff and I aren't, aren't some magical business people that, that knew how to run a business and just aimed it at a brewery. Yeah. We liked home brewing. That's it. Yeah. So we're a couple of IT nerds that liked home brewing and, and we pulled it off because I think there's this mentality of just saying, there is no turning back. You must succeed at all costs. And, uh, and when you look at the things that you screwed up, you go, thank goodness we screwed that up then because of what it means to us now. Yeah. yeah. I think with your kids, going back to your kids there, that work ethic is going to serve them so well later yeah. on. Because I know for me, with my parents, my parents, they started a business when I was about five. Yeah. Um, and uh, just they always had a very strong work ethic. My parents are older, my dad's like 72. Yeah. And I think that potentially was the most valuable thing they taught me was, yeah. was how to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no secrets, there's no shortcuts. It comes from hard work. And, they, and what I love now is they hear people tell me that I'm lucky, oh. right? And we go home at night and I go, what did you think about, about that guy saying we were lucky? And my sons will say, I can't believe, and, and but they get it. They go, but they they didn't see all the hours throughout the middle of the night that mm -hmm. that we worked and 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 pulled this off, right? So of course it seems 
lucky mm. when it see it looks like an overnight success when really there was all of the hours, all of the hours going into you know uh, building it, right? Going through the process, especially in like the first couple of years there, did you doubt yourself often? Like if you're doing the right thing, if you yeah. should keep pushing? Of Every, I, I think if anybody says they're not doubting themselves, they're lying. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't even think anybody is, is self-confident enough to say, of course I'm gonna pull it off. We planned for nothing but total success, but that didn't mean I wasn't laying in my bed at 3 a.m. crying because of the thought of ruining Chuck the fireman's marriage to his amazing wife, mm -hmm. right? And, and uh, it's a horrifying, uh, horrifying thing to think that uh, you've bit off more than you can chew because you were arrogant and just thought you could pull it off and now you're gonna ruin the lives of people that mean something to you and, um, and everybody goes through that. I don't care who you are, I don't care. Mm -hmm. In fact, the more confident you come across, I challenge that, that the more self-conscious you are 3 a.m. laying in your bed at night, right? And so uh, I've got my entrepreneurial pillow that I cry into at night, and uh, and and those nights uh, that that you go through those moments of total fear mm -hmm. are important because I lay in my bed and I'm so fearful that I'm going to screw up the lives of my wife and my kids and my friends and my family, but then I find a solution in the middle of the night. That, that, and then I get up in the morning, I put on my brave face, I make sure my kids know that we're gonna do it, my wife's not scared going to work, and, and off I go. But, but I, think, I think you're kidding yourself if, if you don't think that every entrepreneur has those moments of self-doubt. And um, I just think that we maybe don't talk about this part as much. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think that's a, that's a, that's a flaw in, in, in you know, the way we think. As, uh, I do, uh, well, I, I, I mean, I used to do all the tours at Toolshed. And I remember one day doing the tour, and I, uh, I, I, a guy walked into the brewery and looked into the back, and, you know, he didn't know we were doing a tour. I was talking, but he walked in and just looked into the brewery and went, well, these guys are well-funded. And I almost broke down, right? I just, I'm like, you need to go inside my head and feel my pain of what I've gone through and come out and, and to just think, Ah, they're well funded, and that's just that's it. And I and the whole tour changed for for this group that was doing a brewery tour. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you guys need to know that I have three mortgages on my house right now, and all three of them are in foreclosure. And I don't know how I'm going to save my home. I I I honestly don't know. Uh, and my wife doesn't know that our mortgages are in foreclosure. And uh, and and man, I poured it out. But I never had more of a real connection with a group of people in my life. These people just went, oh, you're a real person. And, and some of them were starting their own businesses and whatever was going on in their lives, they connected on such a real level because all of a sudden, you know, if you come to Toolshed, you look at it, you go, wow, look at this beautiful brewery. But, but to, to hear, hey man, I'm, I'm a real dude trying to pull it off with my friends and family and, and, uh, and I got these mortgages and I'm in foreclosure, I don't have enough money. My wife called me today saying there's no money in the account for gas to take the kids to volleyball, right? And I'm trying to pull it all together, right? And it's, uh, I never saw more of a, of a real connection with human beings than the moment that I was truly honest and vulnerable uh, and open about the, uh, the challenge of, of starting a business like, like Toolshed. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, that was an important thing for me to, uh, to see because it's like, Nobody cares if you're out there spouting out about how great your business is. People want to hear the reality of what it took because we're all going through the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's next? What's the next thing for Toolshed? What do you see yeah. in the future? I imagine your work-life balance is a little bit better it's now. It's much better now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As of March, actually, I've been able to, uh, you, you know, like I said, we've got 40-plus employees now. We're, we're approaching 50, and we've got the ability now to kind of step back from the roles that we've been working full time. And uh, so, yeah, I do get to, to see the family more, which is, which is amazing. However, the, the, the concept of, of what Toolshed has always done has never been about just itself. We've always said, we're about Alberta, we're about all of the breweries, you know. We don't open the floodgates for 100 new breweries and then go, ah, crap, we have a <laughs> bunch of competitors. We're here to support all of the breweries in the city because every one of these breweries is using Alberta barley. Every one of these breweries is hiring Albertans. We're all contributing to the economy in this province, right? So it behooves us to not just be about our own products, but to promote that Alberta should be the place in the world 
that people look to for, for craft beer. So, in fact, have you ever have you ever seen the movie Bottle Shock? No, I haven't. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. For this, you got. Have you seen it? Okay, it's the best. It's uh, it's it's a it's it's a document. Well, it's not a documentary. It's a movie about a true story, um, but it's about the 1976 Paris wine tasting. So what it was was in the 70s. You know, you know the uh, uh, Italians made the best wine, of course, right? Or the French made the best wine. You know, it's it's obviously going to be something over in Europe that makes the best wine. Yeah. So the French are like. Clearly, the French made the best wine, and we'll prove it. We're going to go around the world, and we're going to get wine from everywhere, and we're going to do a wine tasting blind, and that will show that we are unbiased, and we clearly have the best wine. So they almost didn't go to Napa because these pot-smoking freaking hippies in Napa, what the hell do they know about wine, right? But they did, and they grabbed a bunch of great bottles of wine from Napa. It turns out Napa cleaned house. Napa won everything. They won for red and for white. And... And the French were so embarrassed that that uh, this blind tasting uh, put California globally on the map. That day in 1976 is now uh, an historic day in the, the history of the United States. And the bottle of, of wine from Chateau Montalena, this, this Chardonnay, is in the Smithsonian Museum because it's so significant. The day that put California on the map, that put Napa Valley on the map for the best wine on earth. They've since said, redo, do over. And Napa won again, right? So, so whether you like Australian wine or French wine, Italian wine or, or, or you know, California wine, that day was so significant for California because it put them on the map globally. So in Alberta, we grow the best barley on earth. On earth, there's no question. So the best breweries on earth come to Calgary, come to Alberta to get their barley. So that's why Napa won. They just grow the best grapes. They, if you go for a wine tour, you go to where the grapes grow. So if you want to go for the best beer, I suggest you should be going to where the best barley's grown. So Alberta needs its, its bottle shock moment. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of our next role, I think, at Toolshed, is to help the world see Alberta as the place to come for the best beer on earth. So that doesn't come as an individual brewery. That comes by us supporting every other brew in this province to get the quality of beer up fast enough that we can make a noise globally that we make the best beer here. So some of the ways that we can do that is by helping package beer, helping people with quality control. We're now in a, in a position where we've got a lot of really expensive lab equipment. Uh, we've got multiple canning machines. So why wouldn't I put my canning machine in a truck and bring it over to your brewery and help you package your beer the best way possible bring dissolved oxygen meters and, and, uh, and, and, and all the lab equipment to help make sure that your beer is going into a package the best way possible. So that's what we've done. We've started a new business under the umbrella of Toolshed. It's called Cantastic. And, uh, and, we, and, and that business' sole purpose is to support every other brewery in the province, packaging their beer the best way possible and giving them lab equipment that, that, that they might not be able to afford uh, as a startup brewery. So a lot of this lab equipment is hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, we have a half a million dollars in, in canning equipment in our brewery. So, um, so if I can load that up into a truck and bring it to your brewery, at That's first fantastic. it seems weird. Why is this dude bringing all this gear to help me out, right? But, uh, but it behooves us both to put a better product in the market. So I love nothing more than when another Alberta brewery wins an international beer award and puts Alberta on the map because this is where the barley grows and this is where people should come for the, the best beer. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of our goal is looking for that, that bottle shock moment. And, uh, and um, yeah, it, ironically, I get, to, I get to go to Germany next, next year. I've been asked by this company in uh, Nuremberg, Germany to come and try to teach German brewers and German farmers why the connection that we've made between these farmers and ourselves as brewers is so important. So that's a very significant moment in time where you know, a brewery that's, you know, we're six years old um, is going to Germany, who's been brewing beer longer than we've been a country, yeah. <laughs> right? And, uh, and trying to um, encourage them to have that local connection with the barley farmers in their, in their uh, local area. So, so yeah, that's, that's what's next for us. Is, uh, it, it's always got to be something bigger than just our brewery. So I think it's, uh, it's about putting Alberta on the map globally. So where can people go to find more about Cantastic? Uh, well, it's on our website, of course, at, at Toolshed. I mean, of course, we've got uh, some, some cool folks that, that can beer for other breweries. So you can go on their Instagram and their Twitter at Cantastic. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. That was incredibly enlightening. 
Absolutely. Got me really excited about breweries. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You're going to go start a brewery now. Yeah. And I'll support you. I'll come help you can your beer. Perfect. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, perfect. It'll be great. We'll make awesome videos awesome. with our combined gear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 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 Yeah. Great. Nice. Well, thank you so much Thanks, for stopping buddy. by. Yeah, I really appreciate it. it. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime.